He's the man who invented the World Wide Web, a resource that millions of people across the world would literally find indispensable in this day and age. And over two decades after he made that seminal communication between an HTTP client and a server through the internet, Sir Tim Berners-Lee continues to do pioneering work in how users across the world use the World Wide Web. Sir Tim Berners-Lee, thanks very much for joining us here on Headlines today. The first question a lot of our viewers would like to know is, 20 years after you made that first communication, at that point when you were making that communication, did you imagine at all that the World Wide Web would evolve into the monumental resource that it is today? Well, of course, we couldn't back then imagine what it would be like today. But I did call it the World Wide Web. It was supposed to be something on which you could put anything. The idea that more or less everything would end up on it was, uh, would, would have been beyond our dreams. But it's designed to be a very open space in which anybody can put anything. And, that, uh, and the excitement, you know, that diversity that comes from the tre tremendous amount of innovation that's going on out there, creativity. Net neutrality is something uh, that, that you're doing a lot of work on, you're researching it, you advocate a lot of net neutrality, uh, you're involved in a lot of groups that advocate net neutrality. There are several countries in the world, as you, as you well know, uh, that have issues uh, with the unfettered access to the World Wide Web, the resources in the web. China is one of them. There are other countries. Even, even the Indian government has at various points of time considered uh, controlled access to, uh, to various resources uh, that are available on the web. Uh, how do you view uh, this, sort of, uh, uh, this sort of thought process of governments across the world that parts of what, is, what exists on the World Wide Web should be controlled? Well, I think there's one, on one end of the scale, uh, there's a, a, a justified fight against terrorism and against serious unorganized crime, where in fact if a government can have access to the internet, then uh, that can be uh, sometimes a very necessary tool. But on the other, uh, on the other side, there's censorship. Uh, if a government uses censorship for political pur purposes, for example, or uses their ability to spy on the internet to find out who belongs to which party, uh, or, to, uh, or it's not just governments either, you know, the, the threats to the openness of the internet, they come from large governments and also they come from large companies. Because now we use the web for so many things. It's, uh, you know, it's, people think of e-commerce, but also you think of it. Uh, there's also e-health, but also social networking, a lot of our social lives. Because it's so, so, such an intimately connected to the way an individual connects with the world, really it has to be open. They have to have what's now becoming, thought of in many, many places now as human rights, to be able to connect to anyone. If I connect to the web, I should be able to connect to any legal content, I should be, be able to connect to any other person, uh, and we should start look, thinking about that as a human right. Do you see a time when uh, the, the, the World Wide Web won't just be a luxury resource, but will be accessible everywhere, and in that sense, a real human right? Well, I spent, I suppose, 15 years mainly working with technologies, advancing the technology, working with companies to uh, the standards, HTML, HTTP, uh, uh, and all these people who are involved with things like HTML version 5 uh, are, tend to be the people, they're the geeks, and they're the early adopters, and the people who are excited, and the people who are very connected. And then we sat back uh, recently and realized that actually 20 to 25 percent of the world now use the web. And then when you look at that figure, from one side you think, wow, 20-25% of the whole world. But then you realize, wait a moment, they are now in, a, in this new world, this sub-world, this information society, which only involves 25% of the world. Isn't that mean we have a huge duty to the other 75% to see what, find out what, it, what, it, what is it that we can do which will help them get online and become part of that information society as quickly as possible? Uh, one of, the, uh, one of the most prominent recent uh, 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 uses of the World Wide Web and resources on the Internet that we've seen is in the Arab world, the revolutions that we've seen where we've seen these movements actually utilize resources uh, on the web mm -hmm. to mobilize resources, mobilize people, uh, communicate and, you know, and get information out to the outside world. Uh, do you believe technology is now... Uh, an indispensable part of political movements, political processes across the world. We've seen it happen in political campaigns in the West as well. Resources in the web, are they now completely interlinked with how politics is done now? Yes. I, we heard about it yesterday saying without the, uh, he said from his point of view, without the internet, the revolution would not have happened. Uh, I think it's not just, uh, but it's not just revolutions. 
uh, it's, it's not enough just to use the internet for a revolution. You have to realize that for a democracy, we have to learn how to use the World Wide Web as a tool so that we can make the most efficient uh, democracies. While we break down those barriers, and while 25% of the world has access to the internet, 75% doesn't, as someone who does a lot of work about how the internet works, how the web works, how people use the web standards, uh, and, and things like that, uh, is there a sense that there would be absolute disaster if the World Wide Web would have, you know, black out for a few days maybe? What, what, what would happen to the world if the World Wide Web or the Internet were to collapse completely? Well, I, I think... People Considering the dependence it, it, on it. I think uh, people have started asking that question, um, uh, particularly after, of course, it was turned off in Egypt. I think a lot of people who assumed that the World Wide Web was like the rain, it sort of just came, uh, you could depend upon it, uh, realize actually that, that it does depend on people running centers and how they're connected together. One of the original designs of the, 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 the reason it's called a net and not a tree is that it's connected, you know, it is connected as a network. And the idea of being connected in a net network is that the, the internet should not go down if one node goes down. But uh, we need to make sure that this decentralized way in which it's designed, so there's no one control center, is actually reinforced. And I think maybe we need to look at the way it's designed so that that won't happen. Uh, so, because yes, surely, if, uh, if the internet were to go down, the economic effect immediately uh, will be huge. And also, uh, there are a lot of people now uh, use the internet, for example, uh, uh, they assume that they'll be able to call somebody with the internet if they're, you know, if they're old and they want, they want to call for help. They may be now assuming that they can do that over the internet. There are also uh, more and more essential services which are happening over the internet, so it's become very, very, very crucial. Do you think the internet, the World Wide Web, should be governed at all by an agency, or do you think self-regulation is the only way that it can actually efficiently be governed? I think the governance of the, uh, of the internet is a very tricky question and because it's, uh, and it's a question that's never been asked before. We can't go back to ask how a country governs itself or how uh, a non-profit governs itself to see how to govern the internet. We've got to decide, uh, find something completely new and I think uh, that will be a very, really interesting uh, international dialogue over the next decade probably. Do you think uh, privacy issues, violations are inevitable on the World Wide Web? I don't think they're, in, well, apart from the fact that the mistakes happen, I don't think that they're inevitable if we design a system carefully and if people learn about it. But I think we've got, still got to decide what really it means by privacy, uh, what, what we mean by privacy and what do we want by privacy. Some people say that the new generation of young people actually don't care about privacy. I'm not sure that that's true. But I think certainly when you use a lot of websites, when you go to the website and you type something in, uh, I don't think it's as obvious as it should be who's going to be able to see the information you're typing in. So I think we have to work on making better programs, making better websites. To, uh, and we've, in fact, at the World Wide Web Consortium, the consortium of companies which advance the technology, we've had recently a lot of, uh, of uh, workshops about privacy. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about maybe introducing uh, new technology. In the next couple of years, maybe in the next three years, the foreseeable future, if I were to ask you to put it down to three things that we can expect to see happen on the World Wide Web? Two or three things, what would they be? Um, well, I think the most important thing we touched on earlier, but uh, I talked about the Web Consortium, which has been running for 15 years. Recently, we've started the Web Foundation, which is looking about that whole issue, about the 80% and the 20%. So if there's one thing that is going to happen that we should look for is that hopefully, with uh, there are lots of people apart from the World Wide Web Foundation, many foundations, many NGOs, many governments are working to try to get uh, all the, these other 80% as mm -hmm. part of the information mm -hmm. society. When that happens, obviously this, uh, we'll see uh, different cultures, we'll see more of a mix of cultures, we'll hopefully, hope, hopefully see much more of a mix of languages, we'll see, we'll see literature, uh, dance and music from all kinds of different cultures. So I think that's going to be really exciting. I think it's going to obviously though also mean that uh, we have to be careful about having uh, webs that are divided very much between cultural groups. So uh, we'll see a huge increase in, in diversity of material on the web. Uh, in, and, w and whether we see a, uh, the web sort of congealing 
into an English language piece and Chinese language piece and then little an Arabic language piece uh, which really don't talk to each other or whether we see people making personal efforts to people who've learned like everybody should do learn at least two languages using that other language to make connection to somebody in one of, in the other camps to learn what, how it is that they that they think and how they were brought up I think if we see enough people doing that going out of their way to be part of more than one culture then we may see really uh, a world united like we haven't seen before and that w which will be wonderful oh, well we certainly look forward to it Sir Tim Bernersley thanks very much for speaking to Headlines today it's been a privilege privilege is mine